We know that hundreds of Old Testament prophecies were already fulfilled with the birth and the life and the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man. But there's hundreds more that foretell the rest of the story that began at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where we're going to begin. Now there's three important points that I want to make about prophecies before we begin. The first point is this. Prophecy reveals that God exists and that the Bible is His revealed Word. And we know that because as we look down through the years and we see prophecies that happen centuries, if not millennium, before it happened, and we realize not only did the prophecy come to pass, is there still a ringing in here a little bit? Just a little, can you turn it down just a hair, Roger? Not only have we seen these things come to pass, but they come to pass exactly, exactly as they were prophesied. You know, when it talked about Jesus, for instance, coming into the city, it didn't say he came in, period, and everybody said hi. It said he came in on a foal, the colt of a donkey, and that people spread their cloaks and leaves on the ground before him. Now, how would that be known hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, unless God put it there for people to see? The second one is, prophecy shows that above all things, God is in control. What he says, as you will hear in the song later on, what he says, he does. And the third point is, prophecy reveals the consequences of obedience and <laughs> disobedience. And we're going to see that as we go along through this series. Say that and these, last one again, please. I'm sorry? Say that last one again. The last one is that the prophecy reveals the consequences of obedience and of <laughs> disobedience. And these points are going to be made more and more apparent as we go through this whole series of God's Word. The very nature of prophecy reveals its agelessness. Arguably, the first pronouncement of the future fulfillment is recorded clear back in Genesis 3, verse 15, as God revealed this to the devil for his attempt to eat, to eat of the forbidden tree. He said, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and he, he we know, is Jesus will crush your head and you will strike or bruise his heel. And of course, Jesus was crucified, but it was a bruise, not a death threat because he came back from it. Again, note that crushing the serpent's head is a fatal blow. Ancient prophecies that have already come to pass and I don't think we put these up on the board, but Isaiah 7, 14 says, Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Who knows what Emmanuel stands for? God with us. God with us. Isn't that incredible? I mean, there is a word that was among all these people, Emmanuel, and it said the very thing that had happened. God was with them. God is with us today. Emmanuel is my spirit in this very congregation. It was fulfilled, believe it or not, 740 years later. In Micah 5, verse 1, it says, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are, listen, from old, from ancient times. Fulfilled 740 years later. No man, no man, including Micah, who lived, again, 700 years before Jesus, could have possibly known that Messiah would have been born in Bethlehem, not Jerusalem, not Nazareth, not any of those places, but in Bethlehem. And it's a small village, if you look it up, that had absolutely little note in Palestine and would hardly have been named as the place of the Savior's birth if left up to human reasoning. Those of you 
who have visited Bethlehem saw that it's still a small city. It's not a mega city at all. And yet, that's where the Savior was born. Zechariah 9, 9 says this. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Listen, righteous and victorious, lowly, riding on the donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It just narrows it down, down, down until we get to it's a cult of a donkey. And that was fulfilled 578 years later. And that's just three of 400 Old Testament prophecies about Jesus that prove the first point, there is eternal God that exists and that the Bible in our hands is the very word and that he cannot lie. The second point, which verifies that God is in complete control, is established by the very fact that they were fulfilled. Not just fulfilled, fulfilled in detail. And later, probably in another series, as we get up in here, another lesson, we'll examine the third point of what obedience and disobedience means. But for now, we're going to look at how the people that lived and traveled with Jesus all over to see why many of them mistakenly believed that Christ was there to establish the kingdom in their day. Can you imagine those who were waiting in Jerusalem for him and they expected him to come in as a king because it hadn't been revealed to them that he was still just going to be the son of man preaching at that time and he comes in on a donkey, not on an Abram tank, not on a war horse, So now we're going to look at what John the Baptist said. Now John was a cousin of Jesus. And we see this in Matthew 3, verses 1 through 3. Watch this. In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven will come, has come, has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, quote, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And in our recent Bible series that we did on the Gospel of Mark, we read that Jesus' message seemed even more urgent. Let's look at Mark 1. This is verses 14 and 15. So we've already covered this. I want you to listen to this. After John was put in prison, John the Baptist, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. How would Jesus know that the kingdom had come near? Because he was it. He was among them. Now listen again to the words. The kingdom of God has come near. And I want you to remember that statement because we're going to visit and, and revisit and unpack its meaning in just a moment. But the world knows that for the past 2,000 years, the millennial kingdom has not yet come. Now, there there's, are those today who on TV and, and uh, on in, interviews and so forth that mock the very fact that the messianic prophecies are nothing but lies. But the Apostle Peter, this is almost a prophecy in itself. The Apostle Peter warned of this very heresy that we see in 2 Peter 3, 1 to 3. Listen how he gave us warning of this. Dear friends, know this first of all, that in the last days, that's not it, is it? Okay, I'll just read it to you. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it is from the beginning of creation. And notice again that it was Jesus himself that announced the kingdom of God has come near. The Greek word he used for near is in ghetto. 
which means just that, to draw or close in nearby. But not that it's actually come, it's near. And to complicate matters even further, look at what Luke quoted Jesus as saying in Luke 17, verses 20 through 21. Once, on, on being asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because, and he's standing in front of me, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And they knew it not. The King James Version, by the way, interprets this last part as the kingdom of God is within you. Well, this has led to a number of different interpretations. Aha! say the scoffers. That proves there will be no physical kingdom on earth, for Jesus is quoting as saying the kingdom of God exists in people's hearts and minds. That isn't what he was saying at that time. That had a future fulfillment. What he was saying, he was the representative, he was the future king of kings and lord of lords of that coming kingdom, and he was standing right there in their midst. They were looking at him. The Greek word that is used there is entos, which can be translated within or in the midst of. And that latter being more correct in what he was trying to tell these people. And before we continue with this series <coughs> on prophecy of the end times, just ask yourself to have God inspire you with his words. And open your hearts and minds with his spirit. It's so important. Clearly, the man who, under inspiration, wrote the New Testament believed that Jesus was coming for them soon, or that they would be going with him, maybe in their lifetime. And many of their letters from the apostles outlined what was to take place, and if you read it, as if it were going to happen in that very day, at that very time. People were even given a certain amount of comfort when somebody died and they thought, well, they've missed the resurrection. No, it hadn't come as yet. After Jesus arose from the dead, then he appeared to the apostles over a period of 40 days. 40 days after coming out of the grave. And on one occasion, he even commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the gift that his father promised. And what was that gift? The Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that was placed in us when we confessed our sins and accepted Christ's sacrifice. And the apostles crowded around him and they asked this question as recorded in Acts 1 verse 6. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? See how much they believe that? Earlier, during the Last Supper, before Jesus was arrested, there was some strife among them about which of them would be accounted the greatest when the kingdom was set up. It was obvious, again, that they believed it was going to happen right away. But Jesus' answer must have brought them back on their heels. And we see that answer in Acts 1, verses 7 to 9. He said to them, it's not for you, or you, or you, or you, to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit when it comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth. Now, the ends of the earth were not populated at that time. But Jesus knew it would be. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. See, the answer that they received was still open-ended. It probably was not what they wanted to hear, but it was truth. They were told that only the Father knew the day and the hour when Jesus would return, but the possibility of a soon-coming kingdom remained. And this is an aside, and we'll call this Byron, not Bible. I believe that Jesus was fully God, now has been given that day and hour, now that he is in heaven, and he knows the hour of his return by the Father. But during Jesus' earthly sojourn, 
that knowledge would have been a hindrance to him and to anybody he spoke to. And that may explain why Paul said this, and the other apostles also wrote of God's soon coming to specific people and to specific churches, because in their heart, they thought that the people they personally knew in their day was going to be the last generation on this earth. And you know what? That's continued century after century after century, where people have said, Jesus is coming, he will be here on April 27th at 3 o'clock on uh, Main Street. And when that doesn't happen, they said, whoops, I'm, uh, I'm on daylight savings time. Sorry about that. <laughs> there was always an excuse. But think of this. At the same time, if a person at any time in history knew the exact time when an event would take place, there'd be no pressure to prepare except, whoa, I got an hour, I better confess and be saved. And isn't that truth? When we hear deathbed confessions, those are people who really played the lottery <laughs> because they don't know when that deathbed is going to be waiting for them. And so this is God's way of keeping a pressure on us to not know exactly when Jesus is coming, but giving us the hope that he will be here. Look at this in Matthew 24, which is such a, a famous book, and this is verses 20, 42 to 44. And he said, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. I had a friend who was evangelist and he said, you all want to know when Jesus is coming today, I will tell you. He will come at an hour you don't expect. It was not completely fulfilling, but it gave you the whole idea of what Jesus was saying. Now imagine what the early believers really thought and how they felt if they had been told to surrender to Jesus and keep his commandments and endure prison and torture and even death if they were also to learn that the kingdom would not come for 2,000 years. Not a whole lot of desire to do that when you got, well, 2,000 years, I got time to do anything I want. Even now, those who do not understand the importance of including prophecy in their studies, now I'm saying including, you don't focus on it. It's a third of the Bible. It's important. But you need to include it in your studies. And then they may decide to wait and make that deathbed confession. I was a reporter in my earlier career, and I witnessed so many whose life ended suddenly by accident or violent criminal action. And I always wondered later, not then because I had not made my own confession, were any of them truly prepared for the death that came upon them suddenly? And so, here's what God did. He allowed the apostles to keep that feeling of immediacy alive to give the believers encouragement and move them to continue doing good works. Look at how Paul warned of the nearness of Christ's return in Romans 13. This is verses 11 to 14. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And you've heard that. We're a day closer. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here, so... Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And we find... So many phrases about the end times throughout Paul's letters. Without turning to all of them, let me just 
quote from a few. In 1 Thessalonians 5, The day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Then sudden destruction comes on them. Let us not sleep, but let us watch and be sober. A little short snippet out of Hebrews 10, Paul says, As you see the day approaching, as you see the day approaching, it's continuous, you know. It's coming. We don't know exactly when. You need to watch. You need to prepare. You need to be occupied because it can come upon you very suddenly. And then James 5 speaks of this. The coming of the Lord draws near, and the judge stands before the door. 1 Peter 4 spoke of this. The end of all things is at hand. In these last times for you, for the time has come that judgment must begin where? At the house of the Lord. Our judgment is now. We don't want to be in the last judgment. Our judgment is how are our hearts? Have we made that confession? Have we accepted Christ? Are we imbued with the Holy Spirit? And then, of course, there's the Apostle John who on more than one occasion said this, We know it is the last time. Things which must shortly come to pass, and also surely I come quickly, those are all expressions found within the book of John. We know it's the last time. Things which must shortly come to pass, and surely I come quickly. You know, I've often wondered if Paul admonished men and women to remain single because he knew of the prophecy of warning people to flee. So when they were to see the armies surrounding the Holy Land, and there were so many times when armies were surrounding the Holy Land, he may have been thinking of that very time when woe to the woman who is pregnant, and woe if it's summer or winter, and if it's the Sabbath. Look at what he said in Corinthians 7, verses 25 through 28, and you'll feel this immediacy that he's got. Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I underline this. Because of the present crisis. See, he's feeling that crisis of the army surrounding them and everything and thinking about fleeing into the desert. I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. Even if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. How many of you wish you'd have heard that before? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Shouldn't say that. <laughs> Paul is concerned about the church in Corinth when he wrote this. Because of those who were among them were stirring up jealousy and quarreling. And Paul had laid the foundation of the church but the others, not ordained to do so, were trying to build on it, causing divisions. In the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, the apostle said that the converts were infants, mere infants even, in Christ, and were in danger of being led away by false teachers. And we see as we continue that he still sees the possibility, this is Paul, still sees the possibility of the rapture being near, perhaps even in his lifetime. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, verses 29 through 31, and it says this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that, underline, the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Now, I haven't interpreted that yet. My wife said, don't try. Those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world 
as if not engrossed in them. Underline this line, for this world, in its present form, get that? The world in its present form is passing away. Now, I was kidding. Obviously, what he was saying is, don't get too wrapped up in what you're doing in this life, and what you have, in your relationships. Because the time will come when those will fade away and you will have a new relationship. Not in one or two or three or four or five, but in millions of God's children. In a land without violence, without death, without sickness. And so throughout much of Paul's letters and his teachings, we feel this real sense of urgency. See, prophecy maintains the need in the believing church to be aware of worldly pressures that could separate us from God and His Son. And that pressure has been in the church from its inception, clear back in the time when Jesus left and the church was raised up. But for us, for us today, we have the joy of having the hidden truths that we're speaking of right now <coughs> being open in our generations. The significance of that is beyond the pale. <laughs> this is the time, the generations, when we have this Bible, when we can see things that people in the past could not even imagine. This is the time when we have worldwide communication. That's never happened before. This is the time when basically the ends of the earth are filled and the gospel is being preached from one end to the other. We now read the printed word of God, the whole printed word, because it says at the end, don't add to it or take away from it. So obviously when that was written, it was known that this would be the completed work. And understand that even the apostles and the angels in heaven could not have known what we are privileged to know. And if you want to know about the accuracy of the Bible, as many of you have seen when we went to the Book of the Dome, we saw the Dead Sea Scrolls, and did you know that only the Book of Nahum and Esther are the only two books that were not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Old Testament? And they were accurate. For example, we know that as about 400 Old Testament prophecies have actually been fulfilled again in the smallest detail. We did this before, but I want to repeat it again because it is so fantastic. What's the chance of those prophecies being fulfilled outside of the hand of God being on them? Professor Peter Stoner, who is the chairman of mathematics and astronomy at a major college, took eight prophecies, eight, is that eight? One, two, three, five, eight. Eight prophecies just about the birth of Jesus Christ. And he calculated the probability of all eight of them coming to pass just as written centuries earlier. And here was the summation of the odds of just eight of 400 prophecies. It's going to be hard to imagine this, but I'm going to give it to you. The chance was one in 100 quadrillion. You do not want to buy a lottery ticket on those odds. That is a one followed by 15 zeros. Or another way of saying it, one in 1,000 trillions, and we know what trillions are because we're in debt. I'm going to make the odds even more impressive. If we took that amount, one in 100 quadrillion, and we took the quadrillion and we made a stack of $1 bills. You know how thick they are, or how thin. A stack of $100 bills at 100 measures about a half inch. One million $1 bills would equal a 35-story building in height. And I checked it out, and that is right. A quadrillion $1 bills would measure 60 million miles. That's enough to reach the moon and back 114 times. That's the odds 
of eight prophecies coming to pass exactly as prophesied. So it follows then that the prophecies concerning the fate of mankind and establishing a kingdom that will be ruled by God would be just as true. Prophecy proves prophecy. And it also proves that God and his son cannot and did not lie about his second coming when all things are accomplished. So it was in love that God allowed first the writers and then the readers to believe that God was coming in their day. Now let's be honest. We probably believe more than any generation in the past that it is going to be in our day or the day of our, of our children. The only difference is we are now at a time in history when it's possible. We're in a time when the Jews have returned back to Israel. That was prophesied as a final sign. We were born in a time when it says, and this message, this gospel will be heard in all the world. That couldn't have happened before the time of worldwide communication. And so that made this book, this holy book, this Bible, this Christian book, very special to every generation. Because each generation, again, felt that God was coming in their day, and it actually changed their whole outlook on life. Missionaries have covered the entire globe, globe just about telling people about Jesus' soon coming. Just think of the miracle of the Jesus movie and what it's been doing. And how you could go into a, a jungle area with a generator and a projector and a screen and show the Jesus movie. Missionaries are using that. The Jesus movement is using that. And God has probably saved people's lives countlessly, countless times, because of these capabilities. It's probably one of the best gifts that God has given us, the technologies. But I want you to notice, too, as you go through all of this, God gives us these things when it's time for us to have them. God answers your prayers when it's time for them to be answered. Whether it's yes or no, he still has the time schedule when it's going to happen. Yes, the apostles thought it would happen in their day, but we believe sincerely that it's going to happen in our day or shortly afterwards. We're the ones who have been able to open up Daniel. What did it say in Daniel? Go your way. Seal up these things until they are ready to be opened. And we can interpret Daniel. And we're going to look at that in a minute. We're also very familiar with many things in Revelation that no one could understand before. And we can see that it is speaking of world events of the last days as well as the church's last days on this earth as well. And as we said, the book of Daniel goes into great detail about the end of days and the time of distress to come. We know that it's still a future fulfillment, for it says this in Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And the accomplishment of those events prophesied for the end time is proof of the title of this, Today's Events Are Indeed Ancient News. And as we go through this series, you're going to find even more of those things that have happened in our time that were prophesied way back then. Uh, you know, sometimes when we read the Bible and, and we see that there were people alive back in the time that Jesus was born and died and, and resurrected, and they were living in the very time that was prophesied 
in the Jewish books back in those times. And yet, few recognized them. Because God still had given them blinded eyes, deaf hearing, because of the hardness of their hearts. And when he opened up the minds and the eyes and the ears of the church, and he gave us things that we could see now that no one else could see, what a treasure. What a treasure. Something that we had better never, ever, ever throw away. We're the ones, again, who have been able to read what's in Daniel and Revelation and make sense of it. So let's look in, uh, uh, well, first of all, let's do some more in Daniel. Uh, we're looking at Daniel 12, verses 8 to 9. And listen further, as a mysterious man, clothed in linen, continues to tell Daniel of what those days would be like. But Daniel replies, I'm confused. What does this mean? And Daniel said, I heard, but I did not understand. And I asked my Lord, what will be the outcome of this? And he replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up. Remember, this was in a scroll and sealed until the time of the end. Sealed until the time of the end. That means that only the last generations would be able to understand what Daniel was inspired to write. How would you like to be an author that was given something to write, but you didn't know what it was? You'd have to have great faith, and obviously Daniel did because he was selected to do this. And in our day, those verses really have been revealed. And in our day, the last of the signs are pretty much accomplished. And yet the time of distress that was listed in Daniel has not happened. And the multitude sleeping in the dust have not been delivered. So it is we who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture or the catching up of the dead in Christ. And I know that not all of us may believe in pre-tribulation, and that's okay. But those who are living at this moment are looking for what the Bible calls the blessed hope. That's the return of Christ in the clouds, not on the Mount of Olives. And we're promised that we will escape the wrath to come. How do we know that? Well, let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 4, 6, and 9. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then, let us not be like the others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. When he said those who are asleep, he's speaking of those who are blinded and, and deafened by their hardness of heart. Now Paul is showing us how advanced knowledge of what to come is given to the children of light, both in his day and in ours. And what we do with it is on our shoulders. We can ignore prophecy, or we can learn from it. Not in the spirit of fear, or by letting it be a constant focus. And that's important. Not a constant focus. But don't ignore it. But it's, so we'll always be alert. And aware is what, what is taking place around us. And not be surprised. And so we proved two of the three points that we talked about at the beginning. First of all, prophecy reveals that God does exist. And the Bible is his revealed word. Two, prophecy shows that God is in ultimate control. Point number three, that prophecy reveals the consequence of obedience and disobedience is going to be established throughout the rest of this series as we go through it. And over the next few weeks, we're going to unpack Matthew 24, where Jesus himself in person, speaks of his return. And we're going to look at our responsibilities as believers in doing the will of the Father. 
and what the rewards of obedience to Him will be. We will also separate the prophecies that are dealing with the church from those dealing with God's chosen people. We're the church. Israel is God's chosen land and people. And at the point that we stop this series, which will be probably around the end of June, we're going to leave off at the end of the church because the prophecies on Israel at the time the temple is built is a whole other story going to the end. We'll look at our responsibilities as believers doing the will of God, being occupied, and we're going to separate those prophecies from the others so that we know what we are responsible for and what is coming our way. We will talk about fig trees and temple coins and Satan's fury at how expanding knowledge and worldwide communication and the armies today that are surrounding the Holy Land are placing us at the very edge. There's a crackling in the air. There's explosive forces that are planted all around the Holy Land. And there are people with lit torches ready to light the fuse. Until the next time, I'm going to leave you, instead of a regular closing prayer, with these incredible words from Titus 2, verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly pressures and passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us all from wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager, eager to do what is good. Lord, we thank you for these words. We thank you for this church. We thank you for this people. And we thank you that we know your son is soon coming to deliver us from the wrath to come. Amen. amen. And amen. <laughs>